Hello, friends, and welcome to the Midlife Pilot Podcast. It is the podcast all about flying and aviation in midlife. Good evening. I'm your host, Chris Moran, also known as the Midlife Pilot on YouTube. And alongside me, as always, is my dear, dear friend from deep in the heart of Music Row, musician, songwriter, <laughs> uh, filmmaker, um, not to spoil the announcement, airplane owner, mm. uh, mm. Brian Siskind. And good evening to you, sir. Hey, man. How's it going? Uh, your, your intro, by the way, there was a moment there where it was so Orson Welles. It was really cool. It, like, it, For really? It, yeah, just a, just a good evening. Good evening. It was very Orson Welles. But uh, yeah, man, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad to see you. Yeah. Um, and uh, happy to have all the you know folks in the chat. And uh, yeah, we have a lot to to do. So we should just probably start plowing through it. I guess if there's any uh, setup here, we should uh, do that, which is, I guess, to tell people to do things or advertise things or something. I mean, it's always it's always great to have everyone along uh, on the audio uh, podcast with us and wherever you're listening. Uh, if you have not. We would certainly appreciate if you took a moment to subscribe on the platform of your choice. And especially if you're on Apple Podcasts, rate that thing and leave us a review. Uh, super helpful for helping to get the word out just to kind of get this in front of other people who may also be uh, be interested. And we should also remind our audio podcast listeners that we do record this thing live uh, via video every other Wednesday night on uh, my YouTube channel, Um uh, youtube.com slash uh, midlife pilot and we have a ton of interaction with folks in the chat room and hanging out and it's just a good time to like see everybody and catch up man i wish i had seen more of you and uh some of our other friends at, and i know we're going to talk a ton about this tonight at the uh saint simon's island fly-in this past weekend um i did follow along in our discord um and longingly wept um, over all the pictures, uh, of the good times that were being had and had serious, uh, FOMO going on the entire weekend. Well, I, yeah, man, it was, it was awesome. But I tell you what though, did you ever see the Seinfeld where, uh, Jerry goes somewhere and then it's just George and Elaine and then they can't figure out how to relate to each other. And it's super awkward for them until they figure out that if they're just making fun of Jerry, then everything's fine. And yeah. then they, they totally get along. That's kind of how it was. We just basically made fun of you for two and a half. To, no, we didn't make fun of you. But we, were, the point is we we missed you and, and your absence was was felt. But I understand that sometimes work is uh, is what it is. So, you know, um, and we also we did say, though, we we're that's kind of like a threat, really, um, that what we're going to do next time uh, in the interim is I think we're all just going to go to Fairmont and just not even tell you. <laughs> yeah. and then you'll just be there so uh but anyway but yeah it was it was a great just an incredible experience actually and you know so we'll, we'll get more into that but um first and foremost what i want to do is i want to thank michael young who is uh solely responsible for how great that was he you know he lives there he's part of the midlife pilot sort of community and and he i mean the standard has been set to a level of because I mean, he he does hospitality, so this was sort of right in his wheelhouse. Um, but I mean, it was everything was just Johnny on the spot. We had amazing places to hang out. Everything was taken care of. It was I felt like uh, like royalty uh, or someone important, um, and he did that for everybody. And and so I just I, I thanked him about nineteen times, so that you know I could try to convey that. But um, and I know everybody else did too. But it was just incredible. Michael Young did it. Incredible job, and he's a, he's a great uh, serious pilot also, and he he you know flew with us uh, and all that. So um, yeah, you, uh, you know I want to I want to say it was not much fun, and you missed out, but um, or you didn't miss a thing, but you you definitely missed out. Yeah, it um, looked it looked pretty incredible. It really was. I, I can't believe that that's where some people live and fly all the time. It was sort of almost like an alternate reality of just awesome. Uh, but it was uh, a lot of surprises, a lot of fun. But we have a special guest tonight. Um, and so we'll talk uh, about the fly-in with him as well as some other things. Uh, so maybe you can introduce the, the the man, the myth, the legend. Yeah, another uh, midlife pilot community member. Been a long time uh, 
supporter of uh, mine when I started to have my channel going and these kind of came to the first flying in the Outer Banks to kind of save the day. We've told the story a bunch of times, kind of was the hero pilot of like rescuing Brian from his 172 breakdown and also is like the one with the most sense of us to keep everybody uh, on the straight and narrow. So we'll bring him in, our friend Ben, a.k.a. The Sage. Uh, hello, hello. Live from Hotlanta. Yes, sir. Hello, everybody. Thanks we need some crowd noise. Uh, we should get real. Yeah, we should get real soundboardy about this podcast, don't you think? For sure. Uh, how's it going? How's it going, Ben? All good here. No complaints. Um, so I had the the honor and privilege of uh, flying with Ben a lot, both myself and uh, my wife. We got chauffeured. Ben came to Nashville, picked us up, and delivered us to St. Simons, and then also uh, got us out of there. And it felt a little bit like, uh, kind of like a wartime operation on the way out. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where, you know, Ben, you were the difference between, you know, for a lot, you know, for me specifically and for Kate, like we would not have been able to have been there. It was not, uh, even if I had an airplane to fly at that time, uh, it was not a, a, you know, I know I need to get my instrument rating, but I'm saying it was not a VFR trip to make. No, it was, um, it was a little sketchy coming into Nashville from Atlanta. Um, I, I was looking to pick up some instrument approaches just to keep my currency and proficiency. And so I got to shoot an approach, uh, but it was pretty windy and, and gusty. I remember coming into Nashville and I uh, only had um, one landing there, which we'll talk about later <laughs> with other multiple landings. But uh, I just saw in the chat, um, Eric, I'm not going to tr not even try that name, but congrats on passing the written. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, but then when we got, we took off, you know, we got south of Atlanta, it was, it was beautiful. Yeah. So it was just, I, I think also when you're just so focused on being a pilot and learning and practicing and doing all the things, you kind of forget how valuable it is to just, you know, for me to be in the right seat of your plane and just watch you do your thing with, you know, cause you even said, you don't want to do radios or whatever. I'm like, ah, no, nah, I mean. I, uh, in my experience, when people are, when you're trying to sort of force CRM type of stuff, you know, crew resource management, it kind of actually throws things off sometimes for people that are usually single pilot operations because you're just, you're usually doing your thing and the calls are all part of the, the kind of the biorhythm that you're in. And so I didn't want to, you know, and also I just it, didn't want to have to think that hard. It's funny that you say that. Um, the manager of the tower at where I'm based out of, is a, a high school buddy of mine and I, we went down to Florida. I flew him down there at, for multiple reasons, but, uh, I hooked up the push to talk for him knowing he's very capable of handling the radios as an air traffic controller. And every time they called our tell number, I stole the call from him because I'm mm -hmm. such into that rhythm. He's yeah. like, are you going to let me talk on the radios or not? I mean, it, you, you, you get into that pattern. You're absolutely right. Yeah, Chris, you're good about that. You, you don't have a problem with that kind of thing. I love to jump in. So when I flew down to the Nashville flying with uh, Josh, I was excited to do as much. I said, let me do as much as you'll let me do. Like, I'll push all the buttons. I wanted to change. We were fighting a bunch over. I wanted to change frequencies every time. I wanted to do the transponder. I wanted to do all the radio calls. And I think he only stole from me a couple of times. In fact, we ended up with one of the most legendary radio calls in the video of our approach into uh, John Tune, where he was like, well, it was hilarious, but fumbled around with his words. But <laughs> yeah, no, I wanted, I was the opposite. I wanted to do, mainly because it was a, my first time in a Cirrus and I just kind of wanted to touch all the things Jeez. and do all the cool things. Yeah. But, and to be able to make calls uh, on the radio as like Cirrus such and such, like I don't get to do that very often. So I took full advantage of that situation. So we, we got going and then uh, we make our approach. We made a quick stop in um, Baldwin County Airport, get out and stretch the legs, which that was uh, pretty uneventful. Wouldn't you say, Ryan? It was. And then uh, we take back off and for our final leg to St. Simon's. And then that was, not that it was terrible, but would you like to describe the, what happened? You know, there's the, uh, there's sort of the comedic 
punctuation of but I'm that's what Ben did in a but just with landing. It was you know but I'm Michael Young, bless his heart, Josh, <laughs> they all had their cameras out. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me. Yeah, and, there are multiple um, angles of that landing. I've seen yes, them. Yes. And uh yeah, I got my day currency in one shot. I bounced it. I <laughs> bounced it all the way down the runway. Now they were smooth touchdowns, but just had too much energy. We had a lot of luggage in the back. Here come the excuses. Had a lot of <laughs> luggage in the back. Uh, pretty full load, and yeah, I came in with extra power and uh, Captain Kangarooed it right down the runway. <laughs> it really is sort of like a, a. I don't know what it is why we do this to ourselves, but there's like the, there's the fly in phenomena of of landings, you know, and you just want to have a good landing, not because you're trying to put on a show, but just because you just put all this effort to get to this place. And yeah, in your case, there were 12 cameras on you, but, <laughs> um, but you know, it's just funny how, uh, cause even at the, uh, um, outer banks, uh, fly in, oh, yeah. it was, you know, every, and it's always the same thing. Everybody has a bunch of terrible landings with a bunch of excuses that are all quickly nullified by the one person <laughs> that had no problem whatsoever the entire time. In the Outer Banks, it was one dull geek. He was just, you know, like, what? I don't know what your problem is, guys. <laughs> so um, uh, anyway, but that was, it was a fine landing, all three of them. And we were just super happy to uh, to to be there. But then, you know, uh, to just kind of get through real quick, the the activities. I mean, the, the first night that we were there, um, the largest hangar that I've ever seen in my life um, had like a what is like a Beechcraft B it was a twin beach beach 18 beach 18 in there and, and oh what was the other really cool it plane? was commander commander uh, um 118 I think or something like that one so it was a beautiful airplane and then they had this whole room you know the huge you know Michael had the huge spread for us and uh I mean you know and there was also a a, a nice uh birthday party going on and so, so anyway but it was just great we all just were kind of standing there and just looking at the sunset from this hangar just all sort of, I think, having the same feeling of, I can't believe that we're here. This is awesome. It was great to see everybody. Then we all uh, got up the next day and then we had a, a great time. I mean, we went to um, do some flying and like uh, I think Josh had mentioned in the uh, in the Midlife Pilot community discord that we had the right plane to people ratio this time because I think last time it was, there was a lot of planes. So there just wasn't as much uh uh, interaction that way, I guess. But anyway, we flew to, um, uh, let's see, we did Spruce Creek, which is a private aviation community that, uh, Michael worked it all out. We flew in, uh, I mean, this is not like landing on some, you know, grass strip kind of thing or whatever this, their runway was 150 feet wide. Legit. <laughs> it was, it was almost like a, it was not especially long. It was basically like a, a giant helipad that was slightly rectangular. It's what it looked like. <laughs> it was massive runway. But um, anyway, landed there, uh, got some food, and then you get to taxi sort of through the neighborhood and everything. Josh has a very cool video of that. Um, but anyway, so that was an amazing experience that I'm not trying to breeze through entirely, but we got a lot to get to. And then uh, then we did the NASA uh, runway low approach and, um, and then over the SpaceX launch pads and all that and then made our way back and um this is where it got really interesting this is where the next level of flying heroism for the sage <laughs> comes in because we were flying back and i'm i'm with josh and his cirrus michael's with his wife and family and people and you know we're all kind of split up but katie my wife was flying with ben and one dull geek and Everybody else is in all these faster planes. Not that your plane's slow, but just everybody else is in faster, faster planes. Yes. And there was a storm coming and we were seeing all this lightning uh, coming. And um, we got on the ground in what I felt like was the nick of time just to realize that they were still <laughs> a good ways behind us and that storm was closing in. So, uh, Ben, what were your thoughts when you saw this uh, happening? What was happening? Um, it was get on the ground as quickly as possible because... The I'd have to turn around and go to back down to Florida to land if we couldn't get it on the ground. Um, and it was, I mean, we, we made it to time. I was able to put the cover on the airplane and barely make it into the FBO before the bottom fell out. But no, I, uh, I cut it to the numbers. Uh, Katie asked me, was that a more than a 30 degree bang to get it on the final? And wasn't that steep, but it was, 
I definitely made a, a dive to the numbers. Man, I was I was sitting there. Um, we had just parked not long before you got there, and we were looking up, and I, I saw you coming over the the airport, and I, I was just thinking that is a very non traditional pattern to fly into <laughs> an airport. Like he, you know, you could you could just feel the urgency just from looking at the airplane, how fast you were going. And the way that you were approaching, it was, there were the- I share my screen because I saved that picture you oh, sent yeah. me of uh, <laughs> the- um, I did, I got, a, I was standing out by the runway and I got a, a little bit of film uh, of them coming in to land just as the lightning was striking. Yeah. You can see the lightning in the background there. Wow. I, I, I felt kind of like that one guy who was just trying to squeeze it in. But after we got into the FBO, there was actually a guy in an RV taking off as lightning was striking. Yeah. So at least I wasn't as dumb as he was. Mm. See, that's always good to have somebody slightly dumber than you are. But no, exactly. I, that's I, the whole... I, I had, I, I did, I thought about it too. I was like, if they don't, you know, um, if they don't make it here, their diversion is going to be very far away. Um, You'd still be able to outrun it going some direction, but it was just I'd have you turn around and going south. I mean, I'd already had that in my mind. It yeah, was, it's like, well, I guess they're going to be one Indy and go back to Spruce Creek or something because they're going to be in Boca Raton tonight. I guess you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, so I have that to was, say the the SpaceX for me the NASA um, shuttle runway low pass was what really like got me because that's something I really want to do sometime. Uh, and I saw everybody, you had so many pictures and videos in the Discord, the Midnight Pilot the Discord of that event. It looks so incredibly cool. Uh, yeah. Chris, it felt like we were doing something illegal, which we weren't. But, you know, we were just on a CTAF because the tower was closed. And I kept awful. waiting for the F-16s to come form up on us and escort us out of there. But no, it was fine. That must be the time to do it is when the tower is closed because I don't think they would have been... Uh, amenable to, you know, six, you know, flight of six, come on through, who cares? You know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was, you know, I will say Chris though, you know, it's hard to experience when you're doing, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to experience when it's happening because when you fly over the runway, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess really the way to do it, if, if I did it again, I would sidestep to the right, you know, uh, going south, I would, so you can kind of see it, you know, because mm -hmm. you can't really, uh, but anyway, no, it was actually really awesome and more awesome than I was just trying to talk it down, but, um, sorry about that, man. Uh, but you know, Hey, guess what? Michael has set the standard. I'm sure that he's thinking, Oh God, I've created a monster, but we have to make that an annual thing and get more people down there because I considered that the whole trip, I considered exploratory and kind of setting the standard for, for what we can do in the future. Cause that was just a perfect place to do it. Some great flying, a lot of options, beautiful location. Um, and then real quick to get us out, um, you know, we, the next day, uh, there was a lot of flight planning going on, at, you know, uh, pre-dawn hours. Uh, <laughs> we're all out there. I got a picture of a bunch of us all standing out there and they're all looking at graphical forecast tools and, Everybody had their own sort of uh, thing to to figure out, which by the way, um, Sam and Evan and um, Paul, they all took off VFR the day before because um, they were not able to fly that plane IFR just because of, uh, even though Sam is an instructor and all that, he did not have time in that particular plane with those avionics or whatever it was. I forget what the reason was. What was the reason? He just wasn't, he hadn't done any uh, approaches in that 182. Yeah. He was just not comfortable. He yeah. wanted to do some practice approaches before yeah. he had to do a real thing. Man, uh, you know, and Sam, Smart. I mean, geez, you know, young guy, CF double I, keeping us honest. Uh, yep. So it was, it was really, really great to have uh, him and obviously, you know, uh, Evan and Paul around as well. But, <clears throat> but anyway, so um, we did a lot of intense planning and we knew that it was going to be kind of a cannonball run in different directions. Uh, everybody had their own challenges, but I think we had kind of the the steepest challenge. Uh, so, so Ben, this is the part that, you know, as much as I learned from just being around you uh, flying uh, instrument flights, uh, the, I think the thing that I, you know, and Katie even said this as a non-pilot, she learned so much um, that will 
you know, benefit her, I think. And, you know, it won't benefit me because she's going to realize the huge gulf between where I am and where you are <laughs> uh, the next time we try to do anything like that. But, um, but, you know, I haven't got my certificate yet, but I will. So tell me about, you know, maybe describe, because I think where listeners could get the most out of it is to sort of go, okay, here was the stretch, here was the challenge, and then here were the options and, and what were we thinking and how it shook out. So, and I was texting with Josh as well, because um, he's had his IFR for a little while. And and I always like bouncing things off of, with other people that um, have had to deal with these type of things. Um, the, we saw the storm system. It was, it went from Montgomery to, you know, Atlanta by early in the morning and was moving. So the plan was, is to get out and we'd probably have to go, I was uh, my original flight plan was to go to Augusta. I would say it's probably about a 70 mile diversion. Uh, but once we got up in the air, I, I thought it was going to be one of these storm systems. We call them popcorn thunderstorms where they just kind of bubble up and they stay put and then they dissipate. I knew this one was going to have some movement, but I just didn't think it was going to be tracking that much. And once we got up in the air, we saw that Augusta wasn't going to work. So we kept diverting further east. We knew, I knew we could outrun it. Uh, you could see the path. It was just, we had to keep going further east to get around the end of it. And then once we got to the north side of it, then for those of you listening, the, it was going from, you know, it was lateral, it was west to east and it moving in that direction. So all I had to do is get around it and get on, on the north side of it. And it would have been a uh, smooth sailing. So we kept going further and further. We didn't make we were in between Columbia, South Carolina and Charlotte, North Carolina by the time we got around it. But um, I, I was excited for both you and Katie to experience, I don't think you'd done this before, but breaking through a uh, cloud top, especially with the sun rising like that. Um, yeah, that was amazing. That I, that never gets old. And it's also when you break through, but that that was was, I thought it was a, kind of a special moment. It was, it's one of those, it, the funny thing about it though is you're like, wow, this is, we're breaking out of the clouds and all the doom and gloom that's underneath and look at the beautiful sunrise. And then you're looking back to your sort of, you know, four o'clock to look at the sun coming up over the clouds. And then you return your gaze towards the front of the plane and then go over to about 10 o'clock and it's like, uh, black. oh, and so we've got a whole other thing going on here. Uh, that's the storm that we're seeing. So yeah, that was. That was, that was awesome. I, I think that that was, I, I think I was telling you this in the plane, you know, I think that you don't, as a private pilot, you don't get enough experience usually uh, from a typical instruction situation or anything. You're just not going to get into environments like that or see things like that. And what, what made the most, or what was the most impacting to me was, you know, I kept asking you about every five minutes, like, so what, you know, what are you seeing now? And what do you think now? And are you going to try to turn that a little tighter or are you going to go for that gap or, you know, all that? And I just kept, you know, pressing you. You're very patient with me while you're trying to be calm and not let us get killed. So, uh, but I just learned so much from being, you know, uh, being so proximate to the storm, but and safely, but you know, on the, on the, I don't think that that was the most leading edge of a storm system that I'd ever been on safely where you just weren't already thinking about a full on diversion. We, you know, we knew we could outrun it, but I just learned a lot from what you could see and then what are your adjustments? And then, you know, we would come up with a, you, you would, you know, amend our plan for a new destination. And then we wait about eight minutes and then uh, I think we're going to go a little bit more Northeast or, you know, uh, but it was just, it was, it, it was the mother of all deviations. When IFR, you say, I need 10 to the rights because you're coming off your flight plan. Well, that, that was, I need 30, right. I need 30 more, right. I need 30 more, right. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the funnier moments, um, Josh was ahead of us and I, I had saw a gap, I'd seen a gap, um, that I thought we could get through. And I had asked the controller and he goes, there's a Cirrus. Uh, he asked Josh's Cirrus you know, what's the state conditions? And Josh said, it's, we're between layers and light precipitation. And I heard his tail number, 246 Delta Mike. And, and he comes back to me and he goes, yeah, he says it's pretty nice up that way. And I go, yeah, I know that guy. He's a pretty decent guy. And then Josh comes on and says, well, you're not that bad. You're not so bad yourself. And then the controller immediately goes, I need you to switch this frequency. <laughs> he wanted to break us up. So we wouldn't start chat, uh, chatting on the frequency. 
Clues is our. Oh, that's yeah. Funny. But obviously all is well. We, we, we yeah. made it to uh, Blairsville, Georgia, had an awesome breakfast. I'm still thinking about uh, how, how awesome that little place was. Yep. There's a little hole in the wall place called Hole in the Wall. Yep. And, um, uh, and then we, we got on home with, with no issues. And then I was, you know, I was worried about, is, you know, Ben, because you've just been flying so much. Is he going to have enough juice to, you know, is it, does it feel like, I hope it doesn't feel like a big slog for you to go home. And then I hear, uh, that you sat at John Toon for probably 30 minutes trying to get your clearance and all that. So I was oh just, well, that was just a long line. Everybody was waiting to take off. It was, it was ridiculous. I actually took a picture that put me on a very long upwind. And then a, I was 9,000 feet by the time I was downwind. And wow. I took pictures and there were still like eight airplanes waiting to take off as I was passing. Uh, over. Oh man. It was crazy. It's a pretty crazy place, but you made it back without issue and everything. Got to shoot awesome. another instrument approach. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, so yeah, Chris, as you can tell, it was, it was, a, it was an okay time. It was kind of stormy, a lot of lightning. It, no, it was, you were sorely missed, man. But next well, time, yes, uh, absolutely. you have to be there. For sure. For sure. Um, real quick, uh, a lot of stuff going on in the comments. I did want to give a shout out. Um, I saw... Uh, my friend Joe Sager is in the chat tonight, uh, talking about, he's come down to visit a couple of times, uh, down here to Fairmont. He's made the pilgrimage. So it's always good to see him, uh, with us in the chat and the recording. And I also wanted to mention, Brian, I don't know if you know, um, we, uh, actually on the audio podcast on Spotify, uh, for podcasters, we have a new, uh, supporter, uh, who has joined to, uh, support the podcast financially. We're just going to go by first names, but Drew. Um, has joined us in this past since the last episode uh, a couple of weeks ago as a uh, supporter of the audio podcast. So welcome, Drew, and we greatly appreciate uh, the support. Yeah, that is awesome. And I guess if people don't know what that is, it's a little confusing because I guess we have a lot of hats out. But it's Midlife Pilot, you, Chris, you have your own Patreon, your own thing going on. And then obviously that hosts this podcast. Then I have my own Patreon. Um and then we have sort of a converging sort of community that, you know, I think started off as sort of my Patreon community, but then what's the difference? Let's just put it all together. So we have that going on, but then there's just the, the from the podcast side specifically, um, the audio podcast specifically, uh, which is far greater of the audience than what we do here. This is just kind of a formality for what we do. Uh, we like have people. Greater in volume. Yeah, greater in volume, it's but not, we just, this is more fun. Yeah. So uh, it's actually happening. Is it happening? Are we in a simulation? No, but um, so the idea is that people can support through Anchor, who is the primary host of the podcast, uh, you know, on a monthly basis, 99 cents a month or, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, so that's just something. But, um, you know, and hopefully uh, special thanks again to um, Timestamp Tedder and uh, Alyssa and One Dull Geek uh, in your absence last uh, podcast session, Chris. Uh, they supplied us essentially with a user or listener generated, uh, podcast that was, it was really, really good. It was really good. It was sort of like, should we do that anymore? Cause they're making us look bad, but, mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, if, if you didn't, if you, if you're only checking the video podcasts here, go check the audio because there are things there that don't exist through the YouTubes. And that last podcast was about, uh, from a very, uh, techie kind of perspective, privacy and general aviation. So a lot of things, ADSB, a lot of uh, registration, just, you know, a lot of things around the, the questions around privacy and aviation. It was super educational. Um, and so, uh, you know, thanks to them for, for, for doing that. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be some more opportunities to do that kind of thing. So yep. very, very, very cool. Um, so what's, what do we got next? Well, I think we need to, we should start, you know, we kind of have had conversations internally amongst ourselves about future flying events and kind of how we can, we had a lot of questions. I mean, if we want to get into the nuts and bolts of it, we had a lot of questions from people about, I didn't know about this flying or like, how can we find out more? And I think originally like the, the first one that I did at the Outer Banks was limited intentionally because there were just logistics problems. A big group was going to be a problem at that first one there. Nashville would have been a little easier. Um, St. Simons would have been maybe challenging in some ways too with the volume. But I think we're going to try to start thinking intentionally about making these maybe more um, readily available. Like, you know, kind of announce when they are, 
um, kind of formalize some plans that maybe we can include as many people as can come. So I think next for us is probably thinking about what we want to do in the fall for another event. Uh, maybe one over the summer if we're feeling frisky. Uh, but somebody's already piqued my interest in the Discord. I am on high alert uh, <laughs> for a potential fall uh, event, which I think would be a blast. Can I say the concept? I mean, hey, it's just an idea at this point. But it's uh, just an idea at this point. But the, it was thrown out. What if we all get together in Las Vegas? Uh, and those who are in the general regional area or crazy people like Ben who want to fly across the country, I mean, can fly there or you can fly. It's easy to get to commercially. There's obviously, there's plenty of things to do. There's lots of places to rent airplanes to get checked out and rent GA airplanes, lots at several airports. Um, and there's cool places to fly in and around the desert area. I mean, that's an area that a lot of us probably have never flown. I mean, never flown a GA airplane. And I just think it'd be super cool to go out and experience some of the stuff out in the, um, out in the desert West. Uh, yes. It, to me, it would be like flying on the moon or something. It would be so different. Yeah. And everywhere is a landing strip. So like, you know, you've got options to land everywhere if you have a problem. So I don't know. I think it'd be a cool thing to kick around and see if we can make something happen for that in the fall. I, I do not want to do Las Vegas in the summer. That would definitely be a fall uh, trip. But um, I like it. I mean, I think I think we're onto something uh, or maybe we're just on something. We'll see. Uh, but I know it. <laughs> we're both. We're both. Uh, but yeah. And then uh, real quick, um, I am now uh, an airplane owner. Now I'm as poor as everybody else. Um, poor with equity, I guess. I don't know. It's kind of like. Uh, Did you tell the story on the audio podcast yet about what happened to your archer I, that you were flying? I don't, I don't know I, that we said it on the audio podcast yet. Man, what a what a long tale. I'm gonna try to keep it short, but just yeah, just give the clip. So notes. basically, um was renting a 1979 Archer 2, and it was based out of John Toon here. And it was a special kind of rental arrangement that allowed us the freedom to travel, and it was a neat kind of a small group of pilots that were renting it, and it was great. Um, one day, uh, March 3rd, we had, uh, a gradient wind event here that apparently is very rare and the winds were gusting more than 60 kind of all day. And it just kept going and going and going this plane, um, the tie downs, you know, the actual loops, uh, you know, mounted to the wings, those loops physically snapped, uh, I guess one snapped and then the other, um, the plane flipped over smashed the Cherokee that it was next to uh, and then ended up on its head and was a total loss. Um, the way I found out was I had a flight coming up the next day. I I got a sort of a notification or something that I just saw that all of a sudden the plane was up for maintenance just out of the blue for eternity. And this system for the flight school that kind of administrates the rental. And I was like, what's going on? I texted the guy who runs the school. And I said, what's going on with the plane? And he, and he just had one word reply. He just said totaled. And I, I was just like, what? So I went up there <clears throat> and I filmed, uh, all of that. It's on my channel. It's pretty crazy. So, uh, yeah, it was a very sad sight to see. Um, it really felt like you were looking at like, um, I don't know, like a dead animal or something in the, in the jungle. Uh, but anyway, so that was a horrifying thing. Uh, I felt really bad for the owner. Um, so anyway, that was March 3rd. So immediately I'm out of an airplane to fly and I don't really know what I'm, what I'm going to do. Um, and like I said, that, that was a unique arrangement that allowed us to travel and stuff. So just, it's not the same to just go rent flight school airplanes or whatever. I want to go places. So, um, Ben, the sage, just talking to him. Put it on me. Yeah. And uh, he said, oh, I got a great idea for you. Here's how Ben was like, um, I know how you can financially ruin yourself for the rest of your life. Exactly right. <laughs> no, but uh, he had a great idea. He basically said, you know, uh, you should look into partnerships. And I just hadn't really gone down that road fully. It just seemed un unreachable, but I had some things working out with some jobs I'd recently been on and had enough wherewithal to um, maybe consider that. I go and I look for partnerships. The first thing I, f I see is somebody uh, asking for 
uh, a new partner to replace another partner in an arrangement out of Bowling Green, uh, about an hour north of here, which is fine. Uh, Great Plain, uh, 1967. Uh, really, it's it's really a 68, um, but late model 67. Uh, Cherokee 180 Delta model. And uh, great guys went and met them and, you know, condensing the story a lot, but essentially bought in. And so now I'm a uh, partner in this this uh, fantastic plane that really feels like the right thing. And it's a great airport to be based out of. It's got intersecting runways. We've got a hangar there. All the things that you can't really get right around here as far as hangars and all that. So, you know, and after all the, what I saw the other plane go through, the last I want to do is have a plane that lives its life tied down if I can help it. Uh, cause you can tie it down all you want and it still might get tossed. So, uh, granted a hanger, you know, we have tornadoes yeah, also, yeah. but, um, uh, anyway, so now I'm a uh, part owner of a plane. It's got dual G fives. It's got a five thirty. It's really, a, uh, I'm getting ready to put an autopilot in it and I'll have a platform to do my instrument training, uh, perhaps I think in the fall. So I'm super stoked and it's, you know, I just started flying it yesterday and I'm still kind of in this surreal is this really happening kind of uh state but you know one of the things i've always said about ben uh you know you you have a natural flow with your plane that it's like a part of you and that is because you've got so many hours in that you know whatever a thousand hours in the airplane that's really kind of more or less the only airplane that you've flown so it's just kind of right. you can just really tell it's kind of like watching a guitarist or something that picks up a guitar that they've had since they were a teenager or something, you know what I mean? Like you can just, it's just a part of their being. And, uh, I, I don't know how long it'll take me to get to that point, but it, I like the idea that it's, it's within reach now that I will be able to get that familiar and intimate with an aircraft. And I think that that combined with the maintenance and the, all the other nightmares and all the good, the bad, the ugly of the maintenance, uh, and upkeep of an airplane and the ownership kind of experience. I feel like I'm now in a part of, I feel like I'm getting a, now a gateway into sort of the full aviation experience that I didn't really necessarily understand how much I was kind of missing. Um, so I'm super, super thrilled. And, um, and so, yeah, it's on. Um, it's great. Yeah. Um, and one dog geek would like to like, would, uh, like to contribute to your, to your fund here. Uh, he, uh, gave a $2 super chat message to help you with the new airplane owner because you're going to use it because that's going to make a huge difference in your, <laughs> in your budget oh no yeah. that's that's really sweet uh, i see a question from rob smith here brian did you set up an that. llc yeah. for the partnership i bought into an existing llc because i was replacing another partner so that was the you know i, I really think that the beauty of the situation that i was in is I, I wasn't taking the hand the the plane off of someone else's hand so like the the, the anxiety of the pre-buy and all that kind of stuff. I just didn't really feel like I needed to go down those roads because the guys that are flying this plane, they take their families in this plane. They've got a, a dedicated mechanic. They've got a lot of, th you know, they got a lot of energy and, you know, they've been upgrading the plane. You know, I just feel like it was a good situation. I didn't have to build it all, the whole arrangement from scratch. So anyway, I did not form an LLC. I just bought into one. Digger David says, Brian, the sooner you start your IFR, the faster yeah. you'll get to know your airplane. Yes. Well, so here's the thing is that uh, my plan is to, now that I actually have a plane that I can use to do training in, um, this will be great. Uh, when the autopilot goes in in May, after that, uh, it's on. And then, uh, and I think I'm going to do the immersive, um, you know, one dull geek has, uh, you know, been, the, I think the ultimate test case of trying to go about it the local instructor way. And then just realizing that you just got to go and spend a week or whatever it is and, and just be immersed and get it done. And I think that's going to be the way I get it done. Uh, Rob Smith says he's, I just saw some chatter oh, flying nice. by in the, in the chat room here. He's flying a 1981 beach sundowner out of McKinney, Texas. I will tell you, um, if we had not found this airplane, a sundowner was on my short of short lists as the plane we wanted to buy to lease back to the club that we run here. It was on, I was searching for a sundowner because it's low wing. And it has a door on both sides. Yeah. Um, and it's it's widely comfortable. Like it's a cool airplane. Like that was the Sundowner was the top of my of my want list before we found the two thirty five. And such a cool name. Uh, yeah. And by the way, McKinney, Texas. I've flown into there uh, last. I know year. why. Why is that? Where is that? Is there a mural there? Oh yeah. So my friend uh, Guido painted a. He was 
painting a giant silo there in McKinney, a giant mural. And so I went to go visit him and hang out and watch him do some of that, hang out for a while. So yeah, that was, um, that airport's awesome. The FBO. It's a great airport. I, I had, I've had the opportunity to fly in there once. And yeah. I'll go back. It, I'm curious, Rob, if you could mention in the chat, is um, the Sundowner, is it IFR certified or is it IFR capable? Because I, if something that were to happen with me to my plane, if my brother-in-law took it away from me for whatever reason, that would probably be one of the very first ones I look at as a sundowner. <laughs> now, what, what kind of coup are you on the verge of to be nervous about that happening, Ben? <laughs> He's married to my sister, so <laughs> it could really happen at any minute. So. <laughs> Oh man, the, no, it's a really cool plane. Yeah, McKinney is a great place. Yeah. Um, and that airport is, is awesome. I mean, it's, it's a giant runway. The FBO is so nice. Um, they have popcorn. It's ice cream. It's good. Uh, that's so good. yeah, welcome. Uh, it's good oh yeah, you could call it a musketeer. But yeah, that's not as cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So uh, we, we've got a whole list of things we're trying to squeeze through here real quick. Um, let's see. Um, we talked about the Piper army expanding me getting a Cherokee. Um, your, oh, your this is a huge thing. Hold on. Jesus. Hold on a second. Ben, look, I know you're big time in us now because you're making appearances on all the podcasts now. <laughs> um, but if you guys haven't heard Ben's, uh, appearance on opposing bases, um, this other sort of uh, it's more fringe podcast. It's not exactly. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, but but Ben, your your spot on there was was awesome. Um, uh, ben supplied them with the audio of his one thousandth landing at Hearts Hearts Hartsfield. Is that what's called? World's busiest airport. The world's Hartsfield busiest Jackson airport. International airport. Which is so cool. And you had a you had a passenger along for that. That uh, is a guy that we know and and. And appreciate. And so uh, maybe you can tell us real quick about your experience of your your thousandth landing. You know, you got your plane out of annual, you've got your BFR done. This is like, this is reassuring in a sense that it's no matter how much you accomplish, get your instrument rating, get a plane, all the things, there is always something to to sort of celebrate or accomplish our next goal. It, it was a pretty cool event. And for all the uh, newer or younger in our pilots out there, um, Opposing bases always talk about this, where you call your TRACON, your local traffic center, um, to coordinate, or if you have questions, or for whatever reason. So I was totaling up my my logbook. I had finished a page, and I had 995 landings. And it's, it's the only reason that it came to mind that, let's try to do something fun for the thousand. So I called up my local TRACON and found out when is the least busiest time to try to come into the Hartsville. And they have a report that says on Wednesday of this week, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., there'll be 38 airplanes coming into land. And that's going to be the slowest time there is, which I thought I was going to have to do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. But uh, went up. Uh, I think we, uh, one dog geek and I, maybe waited in line at, at my base airport to take off longer than we did when we got to Atlanta. But mm -hmm. took off. They cleared us into the Bravo. Um, the controller said, I need you to keep your speed up. That was my biggest concern is having a 757 come up behind me really, really fast. Um, and, the uh, got switched over to tower and they said, we just need you to make sure you keep it in tight. Don't cross over the runway center line because you'll set off an alert on one of the other jets and they'll do a go around and they'll charge you a hundred thousand dollars. Not really. I was going to say, so wow. we got it down on the ground. Uh, we kept it in tight. Uh, I asked him if I needed to keep my speed up. Uh, my plane can stop pretty fast or slow down really quick. Um, so I was prepared for that. And uh, I said, do we need to keep our speed up? He said, nope. The next plane behind you is 10 miles back. And that was a huge relief for me. So I got it down on the ground. Um, I didn't break one dog geeks back. It was actually a pretty decent landing. <laughs> got off, went to the FBO, paid our $55 landing fee and infrastructure fee had a bottle of water and then got back in the plane and the line was shorter at Hartsville to take off than it was, uh, back at my home airport. <laughs> and, uh, Mark got some, or one dog geek, sorry, got some great pictures of us nose to nose. I'm on the North side of the runway and there's a 737 on the South side and we're like pointed right at each other <laughs> and we got to take off 
uh, in front of him. And I thought about doing some, you know, crazy radio call, tell the 737 to watch out for my prop wash or something, but I, I picked it out. <laughs> we took off and got cleared out of the Bravo and made a nice landing back in McCollum. So it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. I have, uh, I have 367 landings, Ben. So you, I've got a little bit of time to figure out how to, to do something more grandiose than that, but I'm not sure there is, at least in, 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 in this country, that's one of the, that's one of the biggest and baddest. Uh, that's yeah. amazing, man. Well thanks. done. And thanks to everybody in the chat, bearded aviator and Evan, everybody. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> so what else was on the list? Um, Brian. What happened to Brian? Brian is, uh, I have to hit the mute button sometimes and I forget. So, um, timestamp tether is, uh, kind of our resident genius, uh, among many. And in our discord, he's got creeper bot set up which I don't know how exactly works, but essentially it's polling data from um, FlightAware and other places. And whenever anybody in our Discord takes off, uh, if they're willing to have their plane uh, shown, uh, the Discord will notify everyone with the link um, <laughs> that your plane is in the air. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things. If people want to figure out how to get into this Discord, um, I guess the, the gateway is kind of through uh, just messaging one of us, uh, somehow, or Chris can get you in, I can get you in. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, we haven't really sorted this out. We're not very pro, <clears throat> but, um, but Ted also is an airplane owner, uh, soon to be. And, um, what did he call it? A plastic egg with a parachute. Yeah. An egg that flies with a parachute. So, um, we'll leave it to people to guess what, what aircraft, uh, Ted's going to get, but there'll be more to come on that. I'm sure in the next couple of weeks when he gets all that sorted out, but super excited. Uh, I've, I've been feeling really, you know, Chris, as much as you had the sort of FOMO about St. Simon's, the, the sort of exponential dread and everything that Ted has probably been going through while he's been just supporting us and making all this stuff happen for everybody. Guys waiting patiently on a plane, just trying to get it to happen. FOMOing the St. Simon's flag that's all the way across the country. So Ted, special shout out to Ted for for making everything tick and on getting yep. that that airplane, the plastic egg airplane with a parachute. Um, I don't really, I don't know much about this aircraft, but it looks really cool. And we'll, we'll talk about it more when we actually can speak to it without calling yeah. it a plastic egg. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions or things they want us to bring in from the chat, we can go ahead and throw those here on the screen. We can Chris, you got any bond trips there. coming up? Yeah. I uh so um well we were, we actually came up to make a video the other night, if you believe that. My daughter Cecilia and I haven't seen her on the channel for a while. And we were gonna take the 150 out at sunset and do a little tour of some little airports. And uh it, it was two days away from going in for annual. And um okay, I'll kind of tell myself. So the nose strut was could have used a little more nitrogen so it was kind of starting to bottom out on taxi but i'm like you know it's take care of the nose wheel don't land on your nose you'll be all right you know it's fine we got out on the runway and started our takeoff run and about 40 miles an hour you know we've all and if you've flown cessnas at all you've definitely experienced the old uh nose wheel shimmy we i had a nose wheel shimmy that was like fillings were gonna fly out of my teeth like it was so bad. So we aborted, we aborted our takeoff. And I said, you know, that's two, that's two things piling up for me. The nose strut bottoming out and the shimmy was that bad. I'm like, we, we'll just, we'll put it away for annual, not break anything else on the airplane and call it again later. So that was, um, that was that trip. I did fly, to, I flew, it took the 235 to Charleston, West Virginia, to Jaeger International for work a couple of weeks ago. Um, didn't film that flight. It was pretty quick. It's only 40 minutes and it was for work and I was, had other stuff going on, but, uh, but I've only flown, I think, I think I only have about three hours in the last, maybe four hours in the last 60 days, maybe. So it's been pretty limited it's this time of year up here in West Virginia and also just scheduled, right. but 
nothing on the books, but hoping now with the weather getting nicer to get out a lot more. Now all three of our planes are back online in the club, so a lot more options to take planes out. Yeah, it's kind of making up for lost time. I was without flying for six weeks, and then in the last five days with this trip, I got 16 hours in. That's great. Yeah. Wow. Making up for lost time. I was <laughs> Brian, oh, uh, I wanted to tell you too, I looked up my landings um, as well. How about this? So I have 211 total time. That's my total, total time in my log with 211 hours, 411 landings. Wow. And those 211 hours. I have, I guess, 50 more, 50, 50 more hours than you and less landings. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I think it's, I think yeah. it probably, I think it probably goes back to like training regimen and how much, pat. you know, like there probably was some difference in the amount of patterns versus other work that you did, or maybe it just means you are a better, you land better than me. So it took you less practice to get there. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know, man. Oh, by the way, uh, Ted mentioned uh, to not forget to mention Alyssa's moonshot that made it on the local news and also, yes, Evan and Sam flew seaplanes. So Alyssa was captured by a news photographer <clears throat> in her area. Oh, this amazing photo that, you know, doesn't translate to the audio podcast, but essentially the plane silhouetted over the gigantic moon. So I sort of think like an ET type shot, but with uh, Alyssa's uh, Cherokee 180 and uh, cool. pretty cool. And then the local news did a story on it because it was sort of this miraculous shot. The thing I thought was so funny about the news story on that, by the way, was the guy was such a See, I, 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 rec I, I recognized this part of myself in this guy when he was like, <laughs> all this whole news story is about how great this photograph is and what a serendipitous moment it was to capture and all this stuff. And the guy's like, he says something like, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's, it's not, you know, necessarily one of my best photos, but it's, but, you know, I did get that shot, you know, kind of thing. He was just like. You felt like it was making too. Yeah, it's just you know how it is as a yeah. as a creative, Chris. It's like <clears throat> you have your own way of ranking these things for yourself. But anyway, that was an amazing photo. Congrats, uh, Alyssa, and she sent um, footage to them, so they had you know in plane footage, and it was just a really cool uh, serendipitous thing to happen. And cool. then uh, yeah, Evan and Sam flying seaplanes. I mean, geez, father and son seaplane adventure. These guys are so so amazing. <clears throat> <clears throat> Bearded Aviator, 120 hours, 448 landings. Wow. Not including the bounces. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's how Ben padded his numbers. <laughs> I was waiting for that one to come out. Uh, <laughs> well, this has been fun. Uh, thank you for both for uh, not making me feel any better about not being there. But it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was definitely cool to hear the stories from St. Simons. We'll record again in two weeks. So... Um, Two weeks from tonight, so April 12th, 8 p.m. Eastern time on the YouTube channel will be the next podcast recording. Not sure what we're doing on that one yet, but then on the 26th of April, working on another uh, special guest, another YouTuber, a uh, YouTube aviator, um, another midlife pilot-er who uh, got his uh, private pilot later in life, and uh, he's a Floridian. I couldn't, we tried to get him this week, but everyone's at sun and fun. So who, who, yeah. um, I wish I was at sun and fun. But, Celebrating uh, the new A30s. Yeah. The new Bose yeah. A30s. <laughs> Everybody order yours yet? <laughs> no. um, yeah. So uh, that should be fun. We're really looking forward to the 26th of April. Um, it should be a lot of fun. We'll tell you more about it as we get closer. We'll definitely publish that one out ahead of time. i uh, give everybody a heads up, but uh, it should be a great discussion on that night. So I hope you can hang out with us live. And if not, thank you for listening to the audio podcast. Uh, and Sage, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. I appreciate the invite. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you both. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking care of me and Katie so well. It's flying safe with us and teaching so much as you do just by being a great pilot and um and and chris um you were there in spirit sir we definitely we, sir. we, we talked you know we, we we were all feeling the the absence so um you know it wasn't just uh it wasn't all funny games there were tears also uh, uh, boys I'll, I'll see you at the craps table in the fall <laughs> amen <laughs> i'm with you chris i am 100 with you all right. All right. Let's get out of here. All right, everybody. Thanks for potting. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll see everyone in a couple weeks. Bye.